Yeah, I read that and I was like, oh, Ephesians 6, All right. Uh, scripture reading will be from Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put, the, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the, deep, of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against princip principalities, against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of the righteousness, and having shod your feet with your pre preparation of the gospel of the peace above all, taking the shield of faith, which will which will you be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Thank you, Alex. My God bless the reading of the word. What happened on the slide is that the Monday before I take a vacation, I work on the sermon that I have to preach when I get back from vacation. And I put in three hours working on the wrong sermon. After three hours, I think, it's going to be Father's Day when I get back. I've got to do a Father's Day sermon. So then I had to change, and I didn't change the slide. So happy Father's Day to all of you dads who can commiserate with me in forgetting things that you have to do. It's good to be back. We were in Minnesota last week, got to worship with some Christians there. We worship generally every uh, state we go to. We worship with them on Sunday. If not, uh, then we gather with the saints on a Wednesday night. Uh, so I believe that 25 out of 50 states we've been to so far. Uh, and it's a blessing to always visit with Christians in other places, uh, to see the things that we do that are the same, following the pattern of the New Testament, and seeing the things that we do that are different, that might be based on the current culture. But it is to be back, good to be back with you and to be back in the pulpit. Uh, remember this week, uh, Thursday night, uh, if you'd like to come walk with us, uh, 6.30 I think is, is the time, uh, see Richard Wyatt if you'd like to have some more information, or Caitlin. Uh, but uh, it'd be good just to get together and spend time together. Take a walk around the parking lot or around the ball field. Uh, let the kids play. Just spend a little bit of time together. Let's have a word of prayer for our dads and for those of us who are dads. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that you are our Father. You have chosen to reveal yourself as a father. And that brings to mind strength, wisdom, guidance, love, courage. We are thankful, Father, for our dads. We're thankful for the example that they've given us, for the teachings that they have shared with us, for those of us who are dads, Father, we're thankful that you've given us that, that gift to allow us to produce after our own kind, to produce after our own image, to have sons and daughters whom we can love and embrace, to teach and to challenge. We pray, Father, that you will help us to follow your example, that you have left us in your word to love, to love with patience, to love with wisdom, to love with courage. We pray, Father, that you will bless each of us, that we will be the kind of example to our children that you would have us to be. We pray, Father, that we are on the path to heaven and that we are leading our children 
as they watch our example and they listen to our words, that they can follow us as we follow Jesus. Forgive us, Father, when we don't leave the example that we should. And we pray that our children will also learn from that, to learn the grace of forgiveness. And we pray that we can be together in heaven in your presence when our lives are over. Bless us, Father, through this period of worship, but bless our study of your word. In Christ's name we offer this prayer. Amen. Philip Brooks wrote, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers that are equal to the task. Today, of course, is Father's Day. And the role I enjoy more than any other after being Rachel's husband is being a dad. I've enjoyed over the last... Jill turned 21 last year, right? Over the last 21 years, 19 years with Anna, the joy of teaching and sharing my love and my passions. They don't have the passion for snakes that I do, but they can appreciate. And so, dads, if our children are going to be successful in life, we have got to prepare them. And the focus of our study this morning, if you have not yet turned in your copy of God's Word, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul talks about the full armor of God. Because our study this morning is going to emphasize the need that we have as dads to leave our children a legacy of strength, not strength in themselves, but a strength that is supernatural, a strength that is spiritual, a strength that comes from our commander-in-chief, a strength that comes from God's battle equipment that He gives us, the full armor of God. Because we are sending our children out into a world that is governed by Satan. The Apostle Paul describes Satan as the God of this age. And we send our children out into the world in order for them to be successful from a spiritual perspective. We've got to prepare them. And we've got to... Help them find their strength in Jehovah God, in His Son, Jesus Christ. The prophet Jeremiah lived during a time when his country was being invaded by Babylon. And they were being invaded by a foreign country because, as Jeremiah writes, his people, God's people, had forgotten how to blush. They were engaging in behaviors and activities that ought to have motivated them to be ashamed of their behavior, but they had gotten beyond that. They had gotten beyond the point where they could blush because of their sins. And that, of course, is the kind of country that we're living in today. And if our children are going to escape this earthly experience, undefiled, and pure and holy in the eyes of God, they've got to put on God's armor. Because the wolf prays for those who are weak, for those, on those who are defenseless, because they're easy to catch. And so it is imperative that our children be clothed with the armor of God. Now as Paul writes the letter of Ephesians... He is in jail in Rome. It's recorded at the end of the book of Acts. And I can just imagine as Paul is writing in prison that he is chained to a Roman soldier. And as Paul makes this list of the equipment, the armor of God, I can imagine that he's looking at this Roman soldier and he's writing down the spiritual application of this equipment. The first thing, dads, we need to do is to make sure 
that our children recognize that they are in a warfare. Now it might depend to a certain degree on what age our children are, that they're old enough to know what warfare is, and they're mature enough in their thinking to know that they've got to be prepared to fight against Satan. Let's take a look at what Paul writes here in verses... Let's read verse 10 through 12. Finally be strong in the Lord, Paul says, and in the strength of His might. We'll come back to verse 10 in just a moment. But he says, put on the full armor of God. Onward Christian soldiers, the song says, and it refers to the panoply of God. I want you to know what that word means. That's the Greek word translated here, full armor. Panoply means full armor of God. Paul says, put on the panoply, the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now the Greek word translated schemes there gives us the English word methods. Paul says that we've got to be able to stand firm against the methods, the schemes. That suggests the idea of something that is deceitful and it's underhanded, maybe even unexpected. We recall that Peter says that the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. We need to make sure our children understand that they are fighting not against flesh and blood. Look at verse 12. Our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the spiritual forces the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so the devil is walking around looking for our children to devour. Where is, our, is Satan going to show up next in order to devour our children? I offered you a few examples. Number one, he is prowling around in our school system looking to devour our children. What do I mean by that? Our school curriculum is based around the idea that I am at the center of my universe. That I need to pursue my interest and my desires and it's all about me. That's what our school curriculum is designed around. It's designed around the idea that I need to pursue what is right for me. Our school curriculum is designed around the idea that humans are just evolved primates. Satan has our children in his crosshairs. And he's looking to find that he doesn't take bites and nibbles. He devours. And so Satan is prowling around our school system in order to devour our children through these ideas. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against ideas. And that's where Satan attacks. Here's another example. Satan attacks us through our movies that we watch and our TV programs that we watch. Family Hollywood is no friend of Christians. Hollywood is no friend of Christians. And from a theological perspective, Disney is no friend of Christians. I'm thankful that Disney continues to put out movies that are good for families. Our families just recently watched two Disney movies that are good for families. Good, wholesome movies. Ryan, The Last Dragon, and Luca. I'd recommend you watch either one of those two movies. But I just recently learned... The TV show on Disney Plus, Loki, the Avengers, in the Avengers movies. And this ID uh, ID here that is presented with Loki, it's hard for you to, to catch it in the movie. But if you blow it up and you look, you see where Loki, is. his sexual identity is fluid. Now, most of us don't even catch that. I grant that especially kids, but I'm simply illustrating the idea that Hollywood is subtly and slowly desensitizing us to God's standards against wickedness. That's what that is. Satan is slowly trying to influence humanity to think that we 
only answer to ourselves and to no higher being. There's another avenue through which Satan devours our children, and that's through the music they, li they listen to. Just like with TV and movies, we're listening to these, the songs and the language that they use and the concepts that they present, and we find ourselves thinking the same things or using the same words. Now, I'm not here to say that we need to block off all of that. I'm not promoting a boycott. Jesus prayed that we would live in the world but not of the world. What I'm emphasizing, dads, is that we've got to make sure our children have the spiritual strength to be able to recognize these schemes that the devil puts in front of us and to say, no, I'm not going to let them influence how I live my life. That's our challenge. I'm not saying that we need to block our children off from the world. What I am saying is we need to try to do our best to make sure our children's feet are grounded in the Word of God so that they have the spiritual strength to say no to the devil's schemes and the devil's temptations. Let's look back at Ephesians chapter 6 and let's see where Paul says that we need to alert our children to this battle that is going on. Back to verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. You see where our strength comes from. If we're not reading the Bible, if we're not attending worship services, if we're not in, in, engaging in fellowship with the saints, then we're not drawing on strength from the Lord. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Not mine. His. And he says in verse 12, for our struggles are not against flesh and blood. That word struggles there in the original language in the, in the original cultural context, it referred to hand-to-hand -hand combat. They didn't have guns. They engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That is close, physical fighting. It could also refer to the wrestling that went on among, for example, the gladiators. But again, we have the idea of close, personal, hand-to-hand -hand physical contact. So Paul is suggesting here that our battle, our fight against Satan is going to be close, is going to be personal, and in fact is going to be bloody because you know the gladiators fought to the death. Our children need to know that they are in a battle for their own souls. There is not going to be a peace treaty with Satan. There is not going to be pacifist in this battle against Satan. There is not going to be conscientious objectors in this battle against Satan. And our children need to know that. And so Paul goes on to say in verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor, the panoply of God, so that you will be able to... Notice what Paul says. Resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Dads, we need to do what we can to make sure our children have a legacy of spiritual strength. Not that it comes from dad. Dads, we're the teachers. The spiritual strength comes from God. And it comes through this equipment that He has given to us. I want to begin in verse 13, where he talks, or verse 14 rather, where he begins talking about the, the armor that we have. And we need to take the full armor, the panoply. We don't just need to take two or three of them. We need to take the full armor of God. Can you imagine? Now I understand this is going to take a, a, a great stretch of the imagination. But can you imagine that the Detroit Lions, Cleveland Browns are playing in the Super Bowl? And so the Lions offense gets out on the field and they've got all of their equipment on, all of their pads on, except the helmet. The whole offensive line walks out on the field and none of them have their helmets on. Are they going to win? No, they're not going to win. Well, maybe against Cleveland Browns they would. No, they're not going to win because they're not going to play hard. They're going to be protecting part of their body that is exposed. How about if the Cleveland Browns come out on the field and they're dressed in all of their uh, 
clothing, all of their, their football pads and uniform and everything, but they're not wearing their cleats. Are they going to win? Well, maybe against the Lions they would, but... No, they're not going to win because you've got something vulnerable and you're going to protect it. The Apostle Paul says that we need to put on the full armor of God. So let's take a look at this full armor of God and let's think about it in, in the context of we dads teaching our children to have this spiritual strength. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Roman soldiers could wear this tunic, one that's longer than the one in this picture. And if they're rushing in the battle, they would take that tunic up and then they would tuck it down into that belt so that it would free their feet where they could move, where they could fight. The Apostle Paul here says that the, the belt around our waist is the belt of truth. Now we can understand truth here two different ways. They're not mutually exclusive. Number one, it could be the truth that is the gospel message, the Bible itself. And we need to make sure to the best of our ability that our children have an understanding of God's truth because that's what's going to save them when they fight the temptations of Satan. But it could also be truthfulness. It could be honesty. It could be being people of integrity. And so Paul here says that the the, the, the characteristic that holds all of your armor together is the element of truth. Knowing the truth of God and then being dedicated to that truth and living that truth out in your life. That's being a person of integrity. So have your belt of truth around your waist. And then he says in the same verse, verse 14, having put on the breastplate of righteousness... The breastplate, of course, covers your major organs, protects your major organs. Righteousness is right living. That is living your life in accordance with the gospel message. The, the weapon that we have against Satan, one of them, is that we live the way God wants us to live. That's righteousness. It is a long obedience in the same direction. I was baptized when I was 10 years old. I don't know what, time, what, what age I'll die. Let's say I die at 95. And that's 85 years of daily living a long obedience in the same direction. That's righteousness. Paul says we need to use this breastplate of righteousness because it is one of our tools against Satan. When our children are allowed, when our children allow sin to grow in their lives, then they're giving Satan an opportunity to attack their hearts. It's like an invading army that establishes a beachhead on foreign soil. When we sin, we give Satan a foxhole in our heart, to continue using the military metaphor. We give Satan a foxhole in our heart, and he can become entrenched in our lives. And the more we sin, the more we allow Satan to influence us away from God. And so we have to leave a legacy in our children's lives of living a clean and pure and righteous life that closes the door to Satan's temptations. An uncommitted life is an unguarded life against the schemes of Satan. Let's look at the next piece of equipment we have. What about our feet? Now, Roman soldiers had leather footwear that oftentimes had cleats in them because, remember, they're engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And they want to be able to dig their feet into the ground as they're fighting against their enemy. And so Paul says in verse 15, we need to have our, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace. Don't you want peace? Don't you want peace in your life? Peace in your heart? Peace in your mind? Peace 
peace here refers to our relationship with God. I need to know that no matter what happens in my life, I'm right with God. When we went to Minnesota and back, we traveled 1,964 miles. I counted every one of them. When you travel like that, at least I do, I remind myself whatever happens to me on the road, I am right with God. I've got a right relationship with God. When you go into battle with Satan himself, it gives you a great peace of mind to know that no matter what happens, your destiny is secure. Your eternal destination is secure. And that gives us a strong sense of purpose and it puts fire into our bones to be able to go against Satan and to fight against Satan because we know that Satan may be able to destroy the physical body, but he can't touch the spiritual body because it's at peace with God. The shield. Verse 16. Roman soldiers could have two different types of shields. They could have a smaller shield that was two by two that they would carry on their arm. Or they could have a bigger shield, the one that's pictured, that was about two and a half feet wide by four feet tall. So that covers almost the whole body. And if Roman soldiers stood in line one beside the other, then they could create a wall of shields. So Paul here says that your shield, in addition to all of this, taking up the shield of faith with which you you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith is trust in God. Faith is confidence that God is in control of everything. And if something bad happens to me, God has the power to work it out in my life. For my good. Faith is our shield that reminds us, Ephesians 3 and verse 20, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Philippians 4 and verse 19, God is able to do all things for us, for our good. That's trust. That's trust in God. And it's our shield against the flaming arrows of the evil one. Roman soldiers would dip the tip of their arrows into pitch and then light them on fire and shoot these arrows. And so if the arrow itself did not kill someone, then the hope was that the fire would engulf them and kill them. Paul says our protection against those arrows is our confidence in God. I think sometimes that Satan works on us primarily through doubt. He gets us to doubt the power of God. He gets us to doubt the love of God. He gets us to doubt the wisdom of God. If he can just get us to doubt and not have trust in God and the power of his message, then Satan can emaciate God's army. Let's look at the next piece of armor that we have, verse 17. Paul says, Take with you the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the head, of course. Roman helmets were strong and they were sturdy. They were designed to deflect the blow of a broad sword. A broad sword was four feet long. It was wielded with both hands. And if a man got hit on the helmet, it was designed to deflect that blow, to protect the head. What protects our head is our salvation. Our salvation in the past and our salvation in the present and our salvation in the future. What do I mean by that? In the past, we were baptized into Christ. We were immersed into Christ. We had all of our sins washed away. And I know that I was saved from my sins through the blood of Christ. It's salvation in the present, as we've already talked about. It means that I know right now that I'm in a right relationship with God. I know right now, not because of my own goodness, but because of the the blood of Jesus Christ. I am pure, I am holy, I am undefiled, I am separate from sin because of the blood of Christ. That's salvation in the present. Salvation in the future means I know I'm going to heaven. 
It means that no matter what happens to me, I'm going to see Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of his Father. That's salvation in the future. So again, if Satan can get us to question any of that, if he can get us to doubt any of that, then he has a chance of stealing our hearts. Paul says, put on the helmet of salvation to know that you know that you're saved. 1 John 5 and verse 14. And then the last piece of equipment that we have is the only offensive weapon that we have. And that is, Paul says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This sword was a little two-foot-long sword, as we have in this picture, that could be tucked in the belt. That was designed for hand-to-hand combat. And our sword is the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's the gospel message. It's what we use to attack Satan, to get him to leave us alone, as Jesus did in his temptations in Matthew chapter 4. He quoted Scripture to Satan all three times. And Satan wound up leaving Jesus alone for a while because he knew he couldn't conquer Jesus. Because Jesus' confidence was in the Word, in the spoken Word of his Father. And Paul here says we need to use that same tool, that same weapon in our lives and in our fight against Satan. We need to have our children know some of the basic facts of the Scriptures. They need to know the names of the apostles and the tribes of Israel and things like that. But they also need to have a deeper knowledge of the Word of God. The more detailed knowledge of the Word of God. And that's why Jared and Michelle and Rachel and I are putting together this study from the book of Joshua. Joshua was a military leader. Joshua was a great man. Israel was faithful to God as long as Joshua was alive. Israel was faithful to God during the time of the elders who outlived Joshua. The next generation they were faithful to God because of the influence that Joshua had on his people. And so we've put together this study and we're encouraging the whole congregation to study Joshua together. 8, 10, 15 verses each week. The lessons are on the tables in the back when you leave this morning. That's how we're going to be prepared. That's how we're going to prepare our children against the attacks of Satan, knowing the Word of God. Because you can't live the Word of God if you don't know the Word of God. And so the knowledge has to be there. David, the great servant of God in the Old Testament, said that the young shall secure their hearts by taking heed unto the Word of God. Your Word have I hid in my heart so that I will not sin against you, David wrote. That's why we need to know the Word of God and use it in our fight against Satan and teach our children how to use it. We help our children when they're young. We help our children get dressed in the mornings, go to school, go to church, go play. We need to help our children get dressed in the full armor of God. Dads, we need to leave them a legacy of strength. Because I... I'm sure I speak for every dad in here. Our greatest desire is to be before the throne of God with our children there with us. That's our greatest desire. But it doesn't happen by accident. It happens through us spending time teaching and training and showing by example how we fight this spiritual battle. We don't know where Satan is going to attack them. We don't know how Satan is going to attack them, each child individually, but we know he will. And we have to be certain that our troops, our children, have on that full armor of God so they can extinguish the fiery darts that Satan is going to throw at them. It's a big challenge, dads. We don't have to do it alone. We've got the help of Jesus Christ to teach us Help us and train us so we can train our children. If you're here this morning and you are not right with God, we want to provide an opportunity for you to get right with God. If you've not yet given your life to Christ and being immersed into the waters of baptism to have the blood of Christ wash your sins away, we can take care of that this morning. If you want to study a little bit further to know what exactly you are doing, we'll open the Word of God and we'll see what God has to say about it. Father's Day would be a great day to give your life to the Father.
If you're already a child of God and you haven't been living right and you've been losing your personal battle against Satan, the elders are ready to pray for you. The whole congregation is ready to pray with you. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help you in your battle against Satan. Let's stand and sing together.